like I was raised under a different set of conditions than most of the students that I taught when I was teaching public school. Um, I was raised uh, by two parents who, um, you know, came through the Civil Rights Black Power Movement. I um, was raised by two parents who were rooted and grounded in the power of going to a historically black college and university. I was raised by two parents who were raised in a strong black community that had strong schools prior to integration um, and who, who drilled into us, even though we were not raised in that type of community, they drilled into us the standards that, that there was a standard that we had to live up to. Okay. And so we had a very clear understanding of what that standard was and, and, and what it meant to be black and what it meant to operate with the standard of excellence. When I, beca when I became a public school teacher, it became very clear to me that most of my students were not being raised with that same standard and that same understanding, and that they were being deeply, deeply influenced by the media. Well, <clears throat> so one day in class, um, as so often happens, I might be struck with an idea and I would just go with it. And so on the board, I wrote on one side of the board, black male, and on the other side of the board, I wrote black female. And I asked, asked the students to tell me, what are the primary and predominant images that you see of black males and females in the media? Okay. So, you know, they started to tell me. Now, these are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, just to give you an idea of where they were in their particular development and so forth. Uh, about black males, they said, oh, you know, the primary predominant image is we, we see black males in the media, violent, criminal, you know, disrespectful, uh, uneducated, deadbeat dads. With, uh, and, I, and then we went to the black female side of the board, and I said, what images do you see of them? I said, bad attitude, loud, you know, teen mother, unwed mother, welfare mother, video vixens, all these types of things. And so at, when they finished, I said, well, you know, I said, tell me the predominant images. I didn't say tell me the negative images. And, and they were very adamant. They said, well, th these are the predominant images that we see. Said, oh, wow. Now, that, didn't, that did not shock me. Um, here's what shocked me. I don't even know what, what prompted me to ask this question, but I'm so glad that I did. I said, what percentage of black people do you think act like those images you just described? And they said 70%, 80%, 90%. I was absolutely blown away by that because I said, wow, they really got you. They said, well, what do you mean by that, Dr. Cool? I said, I said don't you know 70, 80, 90% of black people are hardworking people, you know, getting up in the morning, going to a job or coming home from a job or getting up to go and look for a job. They're getting up in the morning, uh, you know, going to school, trying to get in school or, or trying to graduate and get out of school. You know, 70, 80, 90 percent of black people are hardworking, law-abiding citizens who are trying to do something positive with their life. But one of the challenges is the media typically zeroes in on a small segment of our community and would have you and the rest of the world to believe that the vast majority of us act like those images that I just wrote on the board. And so my contingency is that there is a minority of black people who act like those images, but it does comprise a significant minority, a significant minority that is kind of turning the tide and taking us away from uh, our consciousness as a people and keeping us unconscious. And so we have to be very, very, thoughtful about that and mindful of the fact that when we are unconscious, other people benefit economically and are able to gain and galvanize more power long as we sleep. But when the sleeping giant awakens, the power dynamics, not only in America, but in the world, begin to shift in our favor. And that is why there's people who have a vested interest in making sure that we remain culturally unconscious. Dr. Kuhl, you, <clears throat> in that exercise that you did, you started to get the young people to think. Critical thinking is something that is 
missing in the way we are taught in the average public schools that our children attend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's done by clearly by design. But how important is it to take, because I want to get into uh, some of the areas that you're talking about, the left brain, the right brain, later in the conversation, because that is mm -hmm. really interesting. But how mm -hmm. important is it to ask the questions to get our children to really start to think critically about situations and things that they either encounter, that they read, or that they see in the media. How really important is it to really start to get our children to think? I, listen, it's difficult for adults to start thinking about things. Uh, some, mm -hmm. some adults, you know, you hate to say it, some adults think like they're young children. And they don't think mm -hmm. critically. You ask them questions and they almost like you're talking a foreign language. But how important is it early on to start getting our children to look at things more critically? I mean, it's tremendously important. It's not optional. It's essential. And the reason that you say even some adults have problems with that is because we have been trained to be unconscious. <laughs> and that's what the whole miseducation process is about. So when, when we say when we talk about critical thinking, we're talking about a type of thinking that does not accept things as they are. It questions things when they happen. And it asks essential questions that the average person might not think to ask, you know. Um, it questions what is normal or what has been perceived as normal. So, for example, um, and one of, the, one of the challenges that we have is that the abnormal has replaced the normal. So we think it's now normal for black males and black females to be involved in violent relationships. We think it's normal for black males and females to be involved in dysfunctional relationships. We think it's normal uh, for people to have children uh, without the commitment of marriage. We think it's normal for black communities to be fraught with violence. We think it's normal for black communities to be, to be fraught with poverty. Uh, so, so the norm, the abnormal has been replaced and we, we've been made to think that these things are normal. That's a function of consciousness. And if you don't think critically about what's going on and start asking the question, why? I'll give you a quick example of some critical thinking. I don't know if you've had occasion to see the documentary, um, Bastards of the Party. If you haven't, uh, look it up on YouTube. Uh, check it out. It's really powerful. The, the, the documentary Bastards of the Party is about an L.A. gang member who asked a critical question. One day he's sitting around with the homies and he said, have we always just killed each other? Was there, ever, you know, how, how, how did we start killing one another so rampantly and indiscriminately? And that led him to start doing some research, interviewing uh, what he called the OGs, the, the, the old gangsters, right? And then he started, you know, looking in the newspapers and going back in time, and he begins to find and discover that what people call gangs actually started out as young black males banding together to defend their communities against white terrorism. <laughs> and then it, it evolved into groups like the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And then this brother, this L.A. gang member, he discovers a confidential file that's written by the LAPD, LA Police Department. And it says that um, we must annihilate the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Their children will be angry and upset. But if we can separate them from the cause of their parents and annihilate their parents, they won't know what their parents were fighting for, and they will then be bastards of the party or bastards of the Black Panther Party. So just the fact that this brother asked that question, the whole miseducation process is designed to ensure that a brother like that never asks a question like that. Dang, did we always used to shoot and kill each other? And if not, what did we used to do? Dang, did we always used to... Uh, was there always this, this, this policy, or not policy, but these instances of abuse in male-female relationships? 
And if it wasn't always like that, when did it start getting like that? And, and when, was it, when was it better than that? Were our families always broken apart? If not, when were they together? And how did we keep them together? And what made it so that so many of them are separated now? Did our communities always used to have violence? Did our communities always used to be uh, infested with drugs? If not, you know, these are critical questions, questions that don't accept the status quo as it is, but we're seeking an answer. And most of us are so caught up in survival strategies, basic day-to-day -day survival, that we don't take the time to ask these questions, or if we do, we don't follow through, follow the research through to its logical conclusion. We're in conversation tonight with Dr. Chiki Akua. Uh, we're touching on a lot of uh, information uh, from his book, Honoring the Ancestral Obligations. Uh, critical thinking to regain, to reclaim consciousness is one of the topics we're dealing with this evening. You can get involved, too, by dialing 215-490-9832. That's 215-490-9832. Uh, Dr. Kuhl, before I pass the mic to Brother Richard, let me ask uh, one other thing, and, and, it's, and it's a comment, and just to get you to expound on it. You know, um, I know when you're in class, I, I, I have a business, and 99% of the people that come into my business is, is black, like me. Uh, mm -hmm. They might see posters on the wall. Uh, they might see a... Uh, a documentary on the television and they might ask me, uh, hey, Mr. Booker, can you turn to so-and-so and so? And I'll ask them, uh, Oh, I don't think you should be watching stuff like that. Now, when you tell our young people that, and I'm not their parents, they might not say anything, but most of the time it might, it might go in one ear and out the other, because when they go home, they have, their parent might have, the programs that they're asking me to turn to on their television. So mm -hmm. when you say certain things about uh, the, uh, the negative uh, programs that they have on, showing women fighting one another, calling one another outside their names, uh, uh, black families dysfunctional, uh, uh, young people selling drugs in the neighborhood, the, the TV is loaded full of them and more in the pipeline, or negative music. Uh, talking about women and men, um, when you tell them, well, don't, you shouldn't be indulgent, don't do those things, you know that the children most likely are going to do them. But I like what you did when you gave them an exercise to do when they watch these programs. After they finish watching mm -hmm. them, to ask the critical questions. And I think by using that approach that you did, that might start giving them the mental capacity or mental capability to start weaning their own self off of those type mm -hmm. of programs almost like a uh, addict you can say listen stop taking drugs but until he realizes himself that he needs to stop then he won't stop but talk about that exercise sure. that you give them about asking into critical questions after they watch these programs well that method we might want to call that the emotepic method if you were in, in one of the schools of education, they, they might refer to that questioning method as the Socratic method, named after the Greek philosopher Socrates, but we know that it didn't originate with him. <laughs> uh, so for, for the purpose of our conversation, we'll refer to it as the Imhotepic method. And that is, rather than telling somebody um, information, you ask a series of questions that guides them to the natural conclusion. Because I discovered long ago uh, that I can't get students to stop listening to certain music. I can't get them to stop watching certain programs and things of that nature. But I can get them to think critically, analytically, and reflectively so that as they mature, they will make, they will naturally make the right decision and start weaning themselves away from things of that nature. Case in point is this. Uh, I developed something called the Akua Media Rating Scale. Now, most of us have heard of the Nielsen Ratings. The Nielsen ratings you may be familiar with, that is quantitative in nature. It simply measures the number or the quantity of people that are watching a program at any given time, usually in prime time. 
The Akua Media Rating Scale is qualitative, meaning we want to measure the quality of a program. And so we ask particular questions that will help us to understand the quality of the program. It's a 10-question scale. And the question, I'll give you the first three questions just to give you an idea. First question is, what is the image of black manhood? You choose the movie, you choose the program, whatever, but the questions are the same. What is the image of black manhood? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. What is the image of black womanhood? What is the image of black family life? Okay. Now, I've done this with, gosh, hundreds of students over the years, maybe even over a 1,000. And the answers are always the same. They get to choose the program. They get to choose the movie. I put them in groups. And it just so happens that last week I was teaching a social justice class at Georgia State University to some early college students. So these are rising seniors. These are you know, kids 16, 17 years old who, because they have accrued a certain number of credits, they can take college classes next year, even though they'll be seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. So this is like a, an introduction to it in a summer program. So I did this with my social justice class. And I asked these young brothers and sisters, uh, they chose the, the, the show Empire. Okay. Classic show, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I must deviate for just a moment and say a teacher told me something very, very disturbing. When I was doing, I traveled across the country training teachers. I was in Detroit doing a training. And during an intermission, after having a conversation like this, a first grade teacher comes up to me and says, all of my students, not some, not a few, all of my students, literally all of them, watch Empire. The day after that show comes on, she said that's all they talk about all day long. And these are first graders. Wow. So I said, man. Okay, so now let me get back to my social justice class. So when we began analyzing that show, the interesting thing about this is the children analyze each of those criteria from 1 to 10, 10 being nice. I said, what's the image of black manhood? And then they start discussing, and some of them even arguing, you know, trying to make their case. Some people said they, had, you know, they rated it a 6 for black manhood. Some said, no, it's a 4. You know, they file in there. One said 5. It averaged out to a, between a 5 and a 6. Then we went to womanhood. Well, you know, and again, same, same types of numbers. You know, it should be a six or a seven. You know, Cookie, she about her business and she, you know, all this kind of stuff. And others are like, no, she's loud and she ratchet. She should get a three and this and that. But again, they averaged out somewhere around five. Then we get to black family life. Now, there was one girl in the class in particular who was really, she liked the program, so she was rating everything a little higher than most of the other students. And she said, now, they should get a 10 for that. Black family life, they stick together through thick and thin, this and that. And then somebody, you know, somebody else will say, well, wait a minute. You know, some of the stuff that they're doing is unscrupulous. Their values might not be in the right place and so forth. So I have to kind of sit back and listen to the conversation because I don't want to preach at them and tell them what I think. Because once they give me the numbers, that's when we interpret the data. Okay. So, again, their answers hover around four, five, or six, average out to about five. And I said, okay, now, according to what y'all told me, the average you said is about a five for black manhood, about a five for black womanhood, about a five for black family life. Five out of ten is a 50%. If you were taking a test and got a 50%, what letter grade is that? You know the answer to that, Brother Elliot, right? <laughs> yes. It's an F. Mm -hmm. I said, so you mean to tell me what you're watching every week is showing you as an F as a black man, F as a black woman, F in black family life. And you're watching that over and over and over. And in the absence of the knowledge of your true empires, in the absence of the knowledge of your true royalty, they will give you a show like Empire. And they will hire the actors and actresses that, that are attractive to you and that are talented to you uh, to keep your attention, all the while socializing, mis-socializing, and miseducating you. And then you begin to unconsciously act out what you see on the screen. <laughs> now, the reason why this is impactful with young people is because I didn't tell them what to think. 
I just ask them a series of questions and help them to interpret what they said they already believe. I didn't give them any numbers. They rated the program based on their values. And then we compare that to, you know, traditional African values. One of the things I've learned as an educator is that you have to help the student to draw their own conclusions rather than giving the student the conclusions for them. <laughs> Brother Richard. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I, you know, I love it. Go I, ahead. You know, um, one to, well, twice I, I, uh, when you came to Philadelphia, um, Brother uh, Kua, um, I was at Kepper Charter School, and you did the uh, series of exercise there. And then also with mm. Africa Genesis, I was um, okay. um, present when you um, did presentation and there. But the first question I kind of like was framing because I, I I think that we, as you're saying, when it comes to education, um, I want to believe and I think we believe that our natural resource is our children. Um, and mm-hmm. we should be developing like them like that. So when we talk about an education system now, not just the learning, uh, when we look over Kemet and Timbuktu and the educational system that the Moors created, what lessons do you see as you, as an educator, master teacher, that you see that we need to um, home in on, especially those of us who may be homeschooling or in charter schools or, or particular teachers that are, are actually um, carrying out those techniques and and understanding that you're saying should be carried out in the classroom? Well, the first thing is we have to regain control of the education and socialization process of our children. Asa Hilliard said socialization is education plus, meaning, you know, life skills, career development, things of that nature, values, character development, spirituality, Education plus is what socialization is, and we have to regain control of that because the socialization process has been replaced in large measure um, by uh, social media, visual and print media, uh, entertainment and hip-hop and things of that nature. I'll say degenerate hip-hop, not authentic hip-hop. And so that's one thing we have to do, regain control of education and socialization. Second thing we got to do is we must dominate where we populate. When I say that we must dominate where, where we populate, that means there are concentrations of black people in just about every major city, but we don't dominate in those places where we populate. You know, there's going to be a Chinese food store. You know, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a European bank. There's going to be, uh, any no, there's going to be a, a Korean, you know, nail shop or something where sisters go to get their their, their nails done or, or or go to buy their hair and things of that nature. So other people economically have kind of preyed on us in the absence of us controlling those things in our own community. And so it's like we're like a a, a carcass, a, a dead body. And the vultures swoop down to get what they need to sustain themselves. And so this isn't an attempt to to hate or cast blame upon those that have set up the businesses in our community. That's a whole different conversation. Uh, I'm not taking issue with them right now. I'm taking issue with us for allowing that to happen. Okay. So we have to we have to dominate where we populate. We but that requires consciousness. Okay. You know, that requires us to say, to ask the question, what percentage of my monthly or weekly income stays in the community? Have I allocated any percentage of my income to ensure that no matter what money goes out of the community, because there's certain things that we just don't produce that we may have to go to some of these other stores, but have I allocated a specific amount every time I get paid that, it's definitely going to stay in our community and change hands with another black person. These are questions that we have to ask. Um, and so when it comes to, when you talk about homeschooling or public school, private schooling, we're still being raised to go through the school system to get an, a so-called education to find a job from white people. 
a job that many of them don't even have for their own people. And so all these different groups of people are scrambling to try to create a reality and a future for themselves, all the while we're expecting to hitch ourselves, uh, hitch a ride on someone else's wagon with no idea of where that wagon may be going. It could be leading to the gas chambers, as Hitler did with the Jews. And so critical thinking to reclaim consciousness must say, we must set up something for ourselves. This is what all free, proud, and productive people do. I like what you said about, um, let's say, dominate where we populate, because that raises the point. And, and, and we re- we're talking about, and, and though we're talking about critical thinking and we're talking about education, we are talking about power, right? Um, and, mm-hmm. and being able to ex- ex- exercise that power. Um, so the, the thought comes to my mind in, in relationship to Ashley. Um, I was looking at, um, I think that's Julian, uh, Janice Hale's. Um, um, book, and I was wondering, um, what do you think of relationship to, even from that perspective of dominate where we populate, that we should be pushing, that there should be a, a pedagogy um, to actually teach um, uh, African children or uh, uh, African American children? Um, do we have one in, in the educational system that is specific to African American children? And if we don't, should we be advocating and pushing for one? in the at where where we dominate and populate absolutely uh there are a number of methods that have been developed and proven to work with our children you have to understand that we have the oldest system of education and teaching and training methods on planet earth and they're not only the oldest they have been shown and demonstrated to be quite effective the problem is we are typically not aware of them, okay? And that's why it's not enough for a black teacher to have consciousness. Not enough for any teacher to have consciousness. That's just the first step. You have to have competence, and there is a difference. I could walk in and I could have voluminous amounts of of knowledge and education, and you put me in front of some first, second, and third graders, or you put me in front of some middle school or high school students, if I don't have competence, meaning skill, as a teacher, those kids will be just as off the chain as they would be with uh, a European teacher that doesn't know anything or, or an African teacher who doesn't know anything about our history and culture. Because knowledge is one thing, but the ability to be able to teach that knowledge in a way that's engaging, understanding our learning styles, and understanding how to engage with the children, that's a whole different process. And so you have to have the consciousness, that's the awareness, that's the knowledge, but you also have to have the competence, that is the skill to actually deliver it. That's why I don't just go in, if I'm working with a group of students like that, uh, I can't just go in and give a lecture every day because that's not demonstrating cultural competence. That's not demonstrating a knowledge of the learning styles of the children, okay? So there are a number of different things that have been shown. For example, when you look at our different learning styles, and I talk about this in my book, Education for Transformation, I have what's called the SABA method. SABA is the oldest word in human history relative to teaching and learning. And the SABA method contains the five um, instructional strategies that I have noticed that master teachers use to bring out the brilliance in our children. Uh, It begins with rituals, that there are certain rituals that you can do. These are just repetitive activities to prepare children uh, to demonstrate their excellence. Uh, Rituals such as doing affirmations, doing drumming with affirmations, calling the names of the ancestors, uh, different things of that nature, uh, warm-up activities to set the stage for academic excellence. Then we have remembrance. That is including and infusing uh, African perspectives and personalities and people in the lesson that you're teaching, not just in the social studies class, but across the curriculum in uh, social studies, language arts, science, math, uh, music, whatever you happen to be teaching, home economics, there is an African perspective on each of those things, okay? And so remembrance 
says, as an instructional methodology, says that we must be, we must infuse everything that we do with the remembrance of our ancestors. Then you have rhythm. If you think back when our, when you were in elementary school, and you all can answer this for me, how did you learn your ABCs? Yeah, they did it. Yeah, they're basically they, singing you know, them. ABCs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You had a song, and the song <laughs> had a rhythm and had rhyme. Well, what we've noticed is that the older children get, the less teachers use songs and with rhythm and rhyme. But that same child that you're not using songs with rhythm and rhyme, they're walking down the hall rapping the latest song, degenerate song, that you can't stand, that you says has misogynistic, hateful lyrics towards women, uh, anti-African lyrics toward African people in general, anti-human lyrics well, that's because the hip-hop artist understands something that the teacher doesn't. That's when I realized I had to stop hating and start studying because they're using the science of rhythm. So that's when I discovered I had to put that in my, uh, in my method for reaching my students. So you got ritual, you got remembrance, you got rhythm. Then you have repetition. That is the meaningful repeating of certain activities, not drill and kill, but the meaningful repeating of certain activities to increase um, skills acquisition. And then lastly, uh, the last thing on the SABA method uh, diagram is relationship. Everything hinges on relationship. You could do all those things that I just mentioned, but if you have not cultivated a proper relationship with the child, none of it will work. Everything hinges on relationships. As a matter of fact, we say rules without relationship equals rebellion. So I don't know if you've ever seen this. When I'm working with teachers, they always say they've seen this. You could take the same child. One teacher will tell them, pull up your pants or go to class or something. They'll be ready to curse that teacher or principal out. Another teacher or principal will come along, same child. Tell them the same thing. The child will pull up the pants. They'll go to class. Why? The, the teacher or administrator that that child responded to is likely one that they have a relationship with. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. Okay? Rules with relationship leads to righteousness. They're going to follow because you have demonstrated a relationship with them. They know that you care. They know that you're out for their best interest. Or even if they haven't realized that yet, they at least know who you are. Because one of the things children are quick to say if you tell them what to do, man, I don't know you. You can't tell me what to do. You ever heard that before? <laughs> I just, I just no heard relationship. <laughs> I just heard it. <laughs> <laughs> no relationship. So these are specific African-centered methods. Far too often they're not taught in the schools of education because Afrocentricity and Af African-centered ways – is not something that's typically respected. I'm thankful that uh, my books are being used in a number of schools of education now, most recently at Southern University in Baton Rouge, which is a historically black university. Uh, they're using the book in, in a couple of their courses. You know, go ahead, if, go, if go I, ahead Richard. One, no, go ahead. One more question, if I can. Um, you know, what you just laid out in the saber and, the, and that process uh, is not just applicable to the educational process for young people, but it seems that for us at community in general, um, mm -hmm. goes to this point of uh, being a community of learners, because the point that you made earlier about um, um, dominate where you populate, it seems in order to, especially in my mind, to grasp this notion that what we are creating is future generations, and that's our responsibility as a community, that's our power relationship, and that's the, our economic stability um, um, in, in, in totality, that we have to create a community of, of, of learners. Um, Elliot raised the question of being in, in, in his um, place of work and, and his influence there. So, But I understand this community of learners is something that is a part of the educational process especially dealing with African-centered education. Can you expand on that a little bit more or, or help us understand that a little bit more? You're saying what African-centered education it's, is? Or community of learners is. 
sure, sure. Well, let me. Well, I'm glad that you asked that because when I I like to make sure that I'm defining terms so that we're operating from the same point of reference. And a lot of times, um, African-centered education gets lost in translation. You know, you have parents who will say, you know, I don't know, I don't know about all this African stuff. You know, we live in a multicultural world. I want my child to be able to function in multiple environments with different people. Well, uh, with an African-centered education, they would be able to do that. Or they'll say, well, the whole world is not black people, so we don't need an African-centered education. That's not what African-centered education is about or supposes. We don't presuppose that the whole world is African or that your child won't be operating in a multicultural world. Actually, quite the opposite. We know that these things are true. African-centered education is using African ideas and African ideals. Ideals meaning ideal situations, ideal values, and things like that. So using African ideas and ideals to analyze information, number one, to meet needs, number two, and to solve problems, number three, in black communities. One more time. African-centered education is using African ideas and ideals to analyze information, meet needs, and solve problems in black communities. The problem is, for most of our people, they're receiving a type of training. I won't even call it education. They're receiving a type of training that uses European ideas and ideals <laughs> to meet needs and solve problems for Europeans. So we, we, we grow up and we, we get the diploma, and then a certain percentage of us who, who we really think have it on the ball, we, we, we get to go and, and have higher education and Man, we get the degree, we get, man, some of us even go on a master's degree, PhD, and, and now we know all their ideas and ideals to meet needs and solve problems for them, not for us. You see, black people, African people were brought to America for one reason and one reason only, to make white people money. Nothing has changed about that relationship. And so it, it seems natural then that they would set up a system of miseducation that ensures that we keep making money for them, even if the way that we do it is by going to jail. Well, they set up the prison industrial complex so that every time one of us gets locked up, they get paid. So that now prisons are privately owned and prison stock is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So if you don't want to go to school, get skills and get a degree and work a quote-unquote legitimate job to make them money, then hell, we'll just lock you up and you can make money for us that way. So an African-centered education helps us to meet needs and solve problems in our own community. It helps, us, it helps to lead us to self-determination and sovereignty, controlling our community, dominating where we populate, not dominating other people, but dominating our space so that it can be of benefit to our people so that we have uh, community cohesiveness, community consciousness, but also with African continental connections. Other people are connected to where they're from or where they say they're from. So Jews are connected to Israel. I suspect, I, I suspect if Jews were the victims of police brutality in America, the way black people have been, I suspect Israel would have something to say about that. <laughs> if, if Koreans or Chinese were the victims of police brutality the way that we are, Korea and China would have something to say about that. And they would, you know, enact some type of sanctions or policies that would coerce the United States government to make some policy changes in the way that their people are being treated. Okay, but we have not enacted the proper relations with our brothers and sisters on the continent to be able to have that kind of influence uh, transatlantically. Okay, and so these, these are the types of things that we have to be thinking about because once that connection takes place, you could have a worldwide revolution overnight and a serious shift in power relations. I hope I hope that answers your question. I, I yes. don't know if I got off on a little tangent, but 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 it brings it brings into focus the point of that 
the, uh, the when I when I seen this community of learning, um, all that you just said is because the whole community is involved in the educational process, and that mm-hmm. the practice and the interest is that we have to take control of that. Now, I just I think that you framed it in the African centered um, context as far as education. Um, very well. So it, it is helpful. Well, let, let, let me give you another quick example. I believe that all of our children should go through an apprenticeship. I don't care if you have a 4.0 in high school, or you're the valedictorian, and you're going to get a full scholarship to college. I believe all of our children should be going through some kind of apprenticeship where, you know, you may study under a master mechanic in the community. You may study under an electrician. You may study under a brother or sister who does uh, HVAC, heating and air. You may study under a cosmetologist who does hair or a barber. You may study under, uh, do an internship at a law office or a medical clinic or something. But all of our children need to go through some type of apprenticeship where they're learning uh, from someone who's going to teach them essential skills. Essential skills for survival, the apprentice under an agricultural engineer or a farmer, someone who can show you how to make clothes or grow food or a, a carpenter or a builder. That way, when we graduate, we have not only the type of skills, acad- academic skills, if we want to go to college, we have basic skills for survival so that we know how to provide our own food, shelter, clothing, and medical care. So these are some things that in a community of learners, we would have those things in place. You know, uh, right now my son is is into photography and video and so forth, and so we're putting him with people who can show him how to do that at a higher level, not just the technical skill of how to do it, but the consciousness to take pictures and to do videos that are uplifting and instructive to our people. Which makes that responsibility for all of us to be participating in, in all in that learning process. So it isn't, uh, as Elliot raised earlier, um, they hear us, but then don't have to respond to us because we've already created the relationship, as you mentioned earlier. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And again, I regard these things not as optional, but essential. We, we have to put these things in place. I don't know what else has to happen for us to understand that we're not wanted here. <laughs> you know, I, I look at what's going on, and I, I'm very concerned. I, I teach children and adults that America has tremendous opportunity, but it also has structured inequality. Our job is to take advantage of the opportunity and to transform the inequality, okay? Uh, However, a lot of times we're so caught up in basic survival and lack of knowledge that we don't even know that the opportunity exists. We can't take advantage of the opportunity. (laughs) And then we're so victimized by the inequality that we can't transform the inequality. So it's, it's, it's really, uh, we're, we're really in quite a fix, and unless we're very intentional about this and create a, a, a group of people that's going to put the proper institutions in place in our communities, um, then we'll continue to see the things that we're seeing today. We're in conversation with Dr. Chiki Akua. Critical thinking to reclaim, to reclaim consciousness is the topic, and we're centering it around the uh, uh, Dr. Kua's book, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations. Uh, we're going to take a brief break in a few minutes. Dr. Kua, before we take that break, because when we come back after the break, I want to delve into that uh, brain-based learning that you talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, but sure. before we do that, you talked earlier when you were talking to uh, Brother Richard about uh, having all the knowledge but not the competence and skill to reach young people in a classroom setting. Do you, in in uh, in your experience, do you notice that that our men or our women are better at uh, the competence and skill to reach young people, or it doesn't really go across gender lines like that? 
I haven't seen it one way or the other. Each of, each has their own um, positive. Okay. And each has their own negative. Do you want me to share that now or wait till after the break? Well, yeah, share it because after the break, I want to kind of break into that brain-based learning. But uh, go ahead. Okay. What I'll say is, okay, so uh, when I first got involved in education, people said, oh, you know, we need males in education. Oh, it's so good to have you and everything. And, and that was true. That is still true today. Uh, we need brothers in education. However, uh, that's no guarantee of success. You have to develop a relationship, po- proper relationship with your students and know how to reach them. If you don't, here's what happens, because I've seen this as well. If you don't know how to reach the students and you're trying to tell students what to do and those kind of things, you become, and excuse my language, you become the nigga that left. You just like my dad. He left. So I'm looking for somebody to dump all of my anger and bitterness on. And so that black male educator becomes somebody for those black children to dump on because they don't have a, a proper male role model in their life. Okay. Now, when the brother does come in, knows what he's doing and is skilled, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I, I've had I've had children, you know, who have asked me, can, you know, Mr. Akua, can we call you Brother Akua? This is what the brothers asked me. I said, absolutely. I had, I had young sisters who said, Mr. Akua, can we call you Daddy Akua? Because none of us have daddies. It's a group of girls. I said, absolutely. You know, so... There are some ways where being a male teacher, being a man, can work in your in your favor. In other words, in other ways where it doesn't work in your favor. Same thing for females. If your sister, that's you know, you about your business, you know your stuff, you know how to relate to the students and everything, it's all good. Why? Because children want to be nurtured. They want that love and positive energy that only a black woman can give. Okay. Okay. However, if you come in there looking down your nose at them and you know, uh, constantly at odds with them, uh, saying negative things to them, then what happens is um, you become an extension of the negative things that they might not like about their mother. Oh, you just another angry black woman telling me what to do. And, you know, that sort of thing, that, that kind of dynamic. And so if you have um, a bitter sister who is a teacher, that can have devastating effects upon the students. Students know whether you want to be there or not. Students know if you love them or not. And students also know if you're scared of them and you can't teach nobody that you're scared of. So, you know, the preparation to become a Saba or a Jedna or what we call a master teacher in the African tradition, is not something to be taken lightly. You know, some people think, oh, if I just, you know, nothing else is working, so I'll try this teaching thing. <laughs> that that don't work. I, I couldn't find a job in my normal field. Let me see if I can get a job teaching. They're still hiring. There's a shortage of teachers. I had two friends that, that went through that. These were young brothers. They were in their 20s. When I was in my 20s, they couldn't find a job in their field. They saw me. I looked like I was fulfilled and enjoyed what I'm doing. They knew, they knew there was a need for brothers, so they tried to do it. In their 20s, one of them, his blood pressure shot up so bad that he had to stop after a couple of months. The, the other one left in less than a month because he couldn't take it. So the common misconception is those that, those that can do, those that, that can't, teach, meaning those that have skills, they they go out and they build a business or work for a business and they utilize that skill. And those that that can't do something, by default, they just go and teach. That is one of the most erroneous things that you will ever see. And, And all you have to do is see a master teacher at work to know, wow, this is magic in the making that I'm watching right now. You can't just put anybody in front of our children. This is interesting, and I was first introduced to it uh, in Janice Hale Williams' book, uh, Black Children, Their Roots, Culture, and Learning Styles. Okay, And uh, for those who are listening, um, the left brain 
deals with more of the analytical processes such as logic, precision, uh, repetition, organization, details, uh, literal, sequential. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, yeah, that's, so, so you have that side of the brain that deals with those processes, okay? The right brain deals more with relational processes. Left, left brain is more analytical. Right brain is more relational, like uh, art awareness, creativity, imagination, intuition, insight, holistic thought, meaning seeing the big picture as opposed to fragments of the big picture. Um, music, rhythm, things of that nature. All of those are right brain functions, okay? Now, one of the things that research shows is that different cultures have what we call cognitive styles. Cognitive refers to thinking. And cognitive style means what you lean more towards. Well, it's been demonstrated that black children and children of color tend to lean more towards the relational cognitive style. It doesn't mean that they cannot or are not analytical in their thinking. What it does mean is that they reach the analytical by way of the relational. So the thing is, they have to, children have to understand how does this relate to me before they start analyzing it, okay? Well, one of the big problems is most teachers, most curriculum, most textbooks and workbooks and most tech, tests are structured around the analytical cognitive style, okay? So if I, as a black child, come into your classroom and you're trained to teach using the analytical style and every, the, the whole curriculum and the textbooks and everything are utilizing the analytical style, but my cognitive style is relational, I'm going to really struggle in your class. Not because I'm not intelligent, not because I'm not brilliant, not because I can't achieve, but because the pathway to my achievement has been blocked by your analytical cognitive style of teaching. Whereas if I had a teacher who understood the relational style of teaching and engaged my creativity, my intuition, my holistic thinking, my propensity uh, towards the use of music and rhythm and my art awareness and things of that nature, I can then reach the analytical by way of, by way of the uh, relational, okay? So what happens is we've had decades and generations and thousands of black children today who are struggling in systems that were not built for them. Some people say the system is broken and it needs to be fixed. And then there are others who say, well, no, the, the system isn't broken. It's working exactly the way it's supposed to by failing our children. So in order to be a culturally competent teacher, you must understand brain-based learning and understand uh, how our children learn from a brain-based perspective, from a brain-based cultural perspective. That way you know every activity that you're doing is meant to stimulate a different part of the brain to elicit a certain response. And most teachers are not taught this. Dr. Cool, let me ask you a question. Um, now, just as a layman observing this, we see Asian students, we see Indian students. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong. They have a cultural style that lends to their students. Um, so are you saying that the European cultural style doesn't match? Well, I, I kind of know the answer to this, but I want you to kind of to make it plain for our audience. Doesn't match our students. Uh, we come from a culture that's, uh, use the term holistic style of education. Europeans, right. we come, go ahead. Yeah, we come, we, we come from a culture, uh, that, uh, that privileges cooperation over competition. We come from a, from a culture that uh, privileges the community over the individual. 
It says, I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am. It's not that the individual needs don't get met in the African-centered way of uh, a worldview, but what it means is that we focus on the community, and if we focus on the community, then the individual's needs automatically get met. Whereas if it's just on the individual, like American hyper-individualism says, I got mine, you get yours. We have a completely different way of doing things. We are holistic in our thinking. We are group oriented we focus on the collective and the cooperative okay and so a lot of the values and perspectives that we're taught from in these schools are the antithesis or the exact opposite of what we naturally gravitate to okay now the reason you may have some asian students who perform well when they come into the school system even though they may have to overcome a language barrier at some point uh and I say some because there's this myth about Asian students being high performing. But for those that do, they typically come into the school system rooted in their culture. Okay. And because they're rooted in their culture, they can then utilize the tools of their own culture to excel within a culture that wasn't necessarily of their making. Okay. When we come into the system, oftentimes we're not necessarily rooted in the best of our culture. So we're receiving lies and miseducation, and we, we're not fully uh, cognizant of the strengths that we bring to the situation. So we've got kind of a double whammy going on here. Now, I will tell you this. Asa Hilliard said something very important in the last chapter of a book called Young, Gifted, and Black. He wrote the last chapter. There are several authors to that book. But he wrote the last chapter, and he said it's called No Mystery Closing the Achievement Gap. And he said something that nobody, anytime you hear people talking about the achievement gap, the gap between white achievement and black achievement and so forth, you will never, almost never hear them mention this. He said evaluation, evaluation research has demonstrated that when black children and poor children have three good teachers in a row, they outperform all other children. I'm going to say that again. When we have three good teachers in a row, by good, he means culturally competent, mm -hmm. we outperform all other children. Outperform white children? Yes, outperform white children. Wait a minute, outperform Asian children? Yeah, outperform Asian children also. Stay with me on this because it, it gets interesting. When you find out when you teach people, whatever people, based on the best of their culture, their achievement goes through the ceiling. In Tucson, Arizona, the Latino graduation rate amongst high school students, I'm sorry, the state graduation rate amongst Latino students was at 50%. Some people got together in the Latino community in Tucson, Arizona, and put together an ethnic studies program to be utilized in the schools. When they instituted that program, the graduation rate for Latino students in Tucson, Arizona, went up to 93%. Why? Because in that Mexican American studies program, or in that Raza studies program, the students were being taught about their history and culture, and they were they were being taught the best of their culture across all of the disciplines, across all of the subject areas. And their, uh, the dropout rate went down, the achievement rate went up, the graduation rate went up, the suspension rate went down. Why? Because they were taught using the best of their culture. And then the white superintendent suspended the program. I, I thought that was the school. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, he, he said, he said, I marched with Dr. King in the 60s, and he said we should judge people by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin, and these race-based programs uh, are not the best solution for our children. We can find better ways to get our children to achieve. Well, wait a minute. You didn't have a better way before. Before they were dragging the bottom, but now that they're achieving, you suspend the program. <laughs> So we see the games that they're playing. Um, it should be very clear what we need to do for ourselves. So, you know, 
these are the things that we need to be aware of, that when our children get exposed to the best of our culture across disciplines, they have the right content and they have teachers who understand the learning styles and the cognitive styles and brain-based functions of our children, man, black power always rises to the top, always. And, and, and that's that's why I have to um, do it with you, one of your um, and the salvas of repeat what you had said before because it, it require, requires that the dominance um, uh, of of the black community enforce and instill that because the example that you you gave is that when even success is not the issue they they, they never I mean I've seen this here over and over again that they they attack success and allow me, uh, mediocrity to exist and complain that it does exist. But if here, we here, as a community here. actually maintain this is the standard that we wish for our children, our, our future generations, it won't, uh, won't be. Well, you have to remember, you always got to go back to this. There are only two languages that the European understands. Mm-hmm. That is the language of violence and the language of money. And to the extent that they can use both of them, they will. So remember, the reason that we were brought here was to make them money. And our failure, they've set up a system where they can make money from our failure. So it's not in, in their twisted mind and worldview and way of doing things it's not in their economic interest for us to be successful. Now, in our minds, because we're a holistic thinking people, we have more of a democratic mindset than even they do. And we're thinking, man, if the the playing field was level, we could all rise together and America really could be great, greater than it ever was. That's naive thinking on our part because we underestimate the wickedness of those that have set out to destroy it. It's, <laughs> oh, good, wow. thinking. it's, it's good thinking <laughs> in the sense that it's, 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 it's peaceful, it's, it's human, it's divine. It's good in that way, but it's naive because we have underestimated uh, who we're dealing with. Exactly. Oh, and so in, in their mind, it's an us versus them thing. They have to set up systems where they can profit from our failure. And that's what they do. I've been all over the country to some of the most challenging schools that you can imagine. And the schools that get some of the best results are the schools that come under the greatest attack. Mm-hmm. You, all are, you, all, you all are right in the city with one of them, Imhotep Charter High School, Mama Chris Wiggins. 100% graduation rate, 100% college acceptance, win the state in football and basketball, academic and athletic powerhouse, African-centered curriculum. She builds a $10 million facility. They put her out of, the, out of her own school that she started. Mm-hmm. All the places I've going around the country where, where conscious and committed educators are getting tremendous results, those are the educators that catch the most hell. Not the sorry and trifling instructors and leaders. They don't catch hell like the ones that get results. And so, you know, this is something that we have to look at and something that that we have to deal with. These are not isolated incidents. It's a serious pattern. I've even been exposed to some situations where there are educational consultants like myself who go in and help to transform school culture and increase student achievement. I know different consultants who have gone into school systems and gotten tremendous results only to have their contract not get renewed. Now I want you to, I want to walk you through this example. Listen very carefully. In that same, in that same chapter of young gifted and black that AC Hillier writes in, he mentions a particular brother who's incredible at math and he goes into school systems he trains the teachers and works directly with the students and raises up math scores one to two grade levels in one year 
So he may go into a school system and he may be dealing with fifth graders who are one to two grade levels behind in math, and by the end of the year, they're one to two grade levels above in math. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. But then, uh, and I know the brother, the widow of the brother he's talking about, I met with her and she shared this with me. She said, a lot of our contracts got revoked. I said, why? You're getting incredible results. She said, we started messing with the money of the textbook publishers. I said, mm-hmm. what do you mean by that? She said, if they have already determined where they want children to be in math, in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, whatever grade, and they, they have their pacing charts, they have their textbooks that they've made to take a child from level to level, and she says, and my husband comes in and then raises them up two and three grade levels, that's messing up the whole the whole system. Y'all follow what's going on? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh yeah. This has nothing this has nothing to do with taking black children to where they can go. The standard is excellence, but we're keeping them at mediocrity or sub mediocrity. I have another friend who went into a school, got incredible results in a short period of time, transformed the school's culture, doubled listen to me, doubled their scores in reading, writing, and math. His, con- his contract got revoked, and he discovered that the reason his contract was revoked, the principal was told by one of the executives in the central office, you guys are moving too fast. This was the lowest performing school in the school system, and they were going to the top. They took the test scores of those students and reported those scores in the name of another school. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a word for what they did in that school system. It's called illegal. (laughs) But you didn't hear anything about that, did you? But I bet a few years ago you heard all that stuff in the news about the cheating scandal in Atlanta public schools. You probably heard about that. Yes. Those are black teachers. But you didn't hear anything about this stuff going on in the Midwest. All white teachers. Let, let me grab this call here because we're getting a little feedback. 626, 646 area code, 646. Yeah, what's going on, Brother Elliot? And hope to your guests. You know, one one of the things that your guest is definitely talking about, and I don't know if he's saying it outright, but why do we expect white folks to educate our kids to be successful when the resources in this country is dwindling and they got kids that they need to look out for because they don't have a guaranteed position in this country like they did 20 30 years ago to graduate, go to college, and do all of the necessary things to come into middle classism. That's not guaranteed no more for white people no more. Mm -hmm. You, You know what I mean? And, you know, for some reason, we as a people are caught up in this whole environment of wanting to be artificial Negroes, which I refer to as Negro Peans, who have Mm -hmm. allegiance to the European more so than they do to the African. Now, the real issue is that our people just don't have no outward vision. Everything is centered on trying to integrate ourselves into whiteness. You're not building as an African people, in all honesty, anything here that's going to liberate you or your people. The only thing that you're going to get here is maybe one or two trickles of success, a.k.a. the um, Oprah Winfrey, the Magic Johnson, the Michael Jordan, and some of these other Negroes. But if you got children and you're trying to give your children a vision to survive on the planet, 
you need to be looking at figuring out how you could take your bond back home and develop some African country instead of you know, trying to develop this hello. In, in light of that, and I appreciate your insights, I want to give the listening audience some resources because I don't, you know, we've been talking for some time. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. And I don't want us to get caught up in paralysis of analysis. We need some solutions. And so if for those that are taking notes, uh, you need to be aware of the AYA Educational Network. That's spelled A-Y-A. Uh, you can go to AYA Ed. That's A-Y-A-E-D. I believe it's dot .org. AYA Ed. But AYA Educational Network, if you Google that, it'll come up. It's an online African-centered uh, school, right? You've also got Kamali Academy. That's spelled K-A-M-A-L-I, Kamali Academy. That's another um, online uh, set of African-centered resources that you can utilize if you're doing homeschooling or if you want to supplement what your child is learning at a public or private school, there are resources there that you can use. Okay. In addition, uh, the weekend of July 14th, we have the Roots to Fruits Black Homeschool Expo, which every year draws at least five to 700 people who come from all over the country to learn from some of our finest scholars uh, and practitioners, not just scholars, but practitioners of African-centered education and homeschooling. Okay. So uh, you can look up Roots to Fruits. Black Homeschool Expo, you can Google that, you can Google, Google Kamali Academy, again, that's K-A-M-A-L-I, Kamali Academy, or AYA Educational Institute, AYA is spelled A-Y-A. For those who are interested in getting uh, any of my resources, because a number of African-centered schools, as well as public and private schools, utilize my books and DVDs and things of that nature, you can find uh, my resources at uh, whatdoesitmeantobeblack.com. Again, that's what does it mean to be black dot com. What does it mean to be black dot com? And to your point, brother, the brother that just called in when he said, you know, white folk don't have it as good as they used to in many cases. Uh, just like there is a widening gap between the black middle class and um, a, a manufactured black underclass, there's a widening gap. There's also a widening gap between uh, the white haves and have-nots. And so part of that is a function of, of, of American capitalism, okay? And so uh, they're not thinking about us. The only thing that they're thinking about us is, is, as they always have, is that we're in the way. So when a black person gets a job, a scholarship, an opportunity that one of them didn't get, they think that it was uh, – ill-gotten gain or as a result of affirmative action or some kind of quota and that we don't deserve what we get. So we have to understand that, again, they don't have jobs for their own people. And so we have to become more skillful in providing a future for our people. And I'm going to give you a quick example of that. I've been studying about this for over 20 years, and what I'm about to share with you is the best thing going for our people. And it's called the Buy Black Movement. Buy Black Movement is composed of black businesses, uh, black consumers, and black marketers who make the consumers aware of the black businesses and their products. The Buy Black Movement has produced over 100,000 sales of black products to black people, black money exchanging in black hands, okay? Okay. We've all heard, you know, Dr. Claude Anderson talk about how the money, you know, bounces in other communities 8, 10, 12, 16 times before it leaves other communities like the Jewish community, Latino community, the Asian community. It, and it leaves our community in six hours as soon as we get paid. And we spend uh, 97 cents on every dollar goes out of our community. 97% of the money that we make goes out of our community. The Buy Black Movement has a solution for that, and the solution that they have is different than just a mom-and-pop business on the corner, which we should support those as well, whether it's a, a, a black restaurant, black cleaners, what have you. Support those as well. 
but this is something that's global. The Bible Light Movement has over 60,000 members in over 100 countries. Bible Light Movement has picked up where Garvey left off. It is a tried and true, powerful and proven system. And I want to encourage those that are listening to become a supporter. How do you become a supporter? Go to BibleLightMovement.com, and for as little as $30 a month, you can get quality black-made products shipped to your door automatically every month. Products that you're going to use anyway, that you're spending money on anyway, like laundry detergent, soap, lotion, shea butter, books, DVDs, posters, jewelry, all kind, over hundreds, hundreds of black-made products, and they're quality products. You become a supporter what happens is as that supporter base grows, it now makes it so that those black businesses have to hire more people to meet the demand. If I know every month a thousand black people are ordering my soap, man, I got I got to increase production. I got to bring somebody else on to help me with that, and that means I got to pay that person, that means I'm providing jobs. When people are ordering my books, I have a black printer. So I don't just get paid, my printer gets paid. My graphic designer gets paid. The brother who, uh, does, who does the transportation and picks up books for me, he gets paid. Black bookstore owner gets paid. You follow? So it has real consequences, and I've been a part of this long enough to see the tremendous results that it's creating for our people. By Black Movement has black businesses that create nutritional products for us. It's an amazing thing. Go to buyblackmovement.com. We're not talking about it. We're doing it and getting tremendous results. And this is very much related to education because we're, we teach children that they're not to be job takers but to be job makers, and we're creating that future for ourselves. Uh, Dr. Akua, can I come back to one of the um, uh, solutions you gave, and that was the, it was, was that the Roots to Fruit? When is that? That is the weekend of July 14th. The Roots to Fruits Black Homeschool Expo. Uh, I yeah, think that uh, was so all, Yeah, all sorts of incredible uh, black educators who will be there who specialize in homeschooling. I, th I thought that both of those uh, series of examples are important because from where I look at it um, in relationship to Brother Jay's um, um, comment and, and thought that there are islands of development that recognize what we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and we have to um, celebrate them as much as communicate them the out there, even though they may not be oceans or seas, um, they are maybe in some places creeks you know, or, or ponds, but they're there. And we have to recognize that those are the infrastructures that have to be built on to create the future that we're talking about. There's a vision for, and that vision is a 200 year, if not longer project, as long as Africans. And, you know, sometimes we get, as you had mentioned earlier, even when watching television and, and the imagery, we, we look at the imagery that's projected to us and don't see what's right around us that is providing the solutions, the development, the infrastructure. And those people who are providing the, the skills like yourself, the services, and, and providing the support that we need in order to become what we yes. need to become. I'm so glad that we made that shift because, as I said, it would be easy to get caught up in paralysis of analysis. And Afrocentricity requires a consciousness of victory. Mm -hmm. Afrocentricity and African-centered education requires a consciousness of victory. When we talk about the problem, it can become overwhelming and discouraging. But we have solutions. There's good news. We have solutions in place. A friend of mine who is the proprietor of the Black Dot Bookstore in Lithonia, Georgia, not far from where I am, he said, he said, parents are waking up. He can't keep enough children's book books in stock to meet the demand. I want you to think about that for a minute. Most people, if you went to them and said, hey, I'm going to open a bookstore, and say, hey, you, 
you may want to take your money and, and do a different business, you know. He said he can't keep enough children's books in stock. He's, he said he's having to carve out and create a special section just for children's books because it's a, his, his bookstore is in a small area inside of a black-owned restaurant, Green Love Kitchen. And he said the parents come through there, and, and my books are selling like hotcakes in there. So we do have problem solvers in place. We have people who are getting results. What we have to do is get the message out because there are a lot of parents who who are looking for this, who are troubled by what they're seeing, who know that they want more for their children. They just don't know where to go. So if you're listening to this broadcast, please share those websites and this information uh, that we've been sharing. Again, my website is uh, whatdoesitmeantobeblack.com. What does it mean to be black dot com? You got to check out buyblackmovement dot com. All of these are resources that that our people must know about. Well, cool. And, and uh, email me uh, that information also, and I'll, I'll make sure I put that on our website. Um, all of those locations and uh, and uh, some of the announcements too about the uh, the roots to fruits. Uh, although it's kind of right up on us, but. Uh, just, just give me all that information. I'll make sure I put it on the website. Okay, will do. You know, boy, we almost uh, the closing time. Interesting conversation. I wanted to go a little bit further, but uh, this this won't be the last time you'll be on it, brother. Cool. And uh, <laughs> okay, you know, we always try to arrange some things uh, so you can come here and we can continue this dialogue in front of a live audience. I think the last time you were here, you went over to. Uh, Canaan when I spoke to uh, uh, Brother Joe. So uh, yeah, yeah. we'll arrange something where you can come in and kind of bring this uh, because, you know, it's always certain areas of this country where a lot of our people are more successful doing things than other areas. I, I do mm-hmm. notice in the, around the Black Belt area, all down south, they're more successful with um, uh, not only their political moves, but the the educational moves, I, I, I listen, I, I'm on social media, and I see what's going on in the Atlanta area with yourself, uh, with Brother Delzino, and some of the others. So I think some of those things need to be taken around so our mm-hmm. people can uh, know what's going on. That's why we utilize our program to get the messages out. But I, I think our people suffer from the lack of knowledge. We don't know a lot of these things are going on, and it's it's by design. But uh, you know, with the advent of social media and all, we can kind of break that that uh, that yeah, and, and dearth we're, of we're knowledge. Up. People are definitely waking up. We just have to be very intentional about our marketing, um, and that's with with anything that we do. Marketing is a science, and a lot of times we relegate marketing to the area of business when, in reality, whatever we do must have that component. One of the reasons that we found out about the Trayvon Martin case back in, what was that, 2011 or so, was be, was through social media. You know, people put the word out. The mainstream media wasn't picking that up until there was a groundswell yes. so much so that they had to. Matter of fact, mainstream media, they're, they're, uh, they're always checking social media to see what's hot, see what they should talk about. So we have to become more skillful in our marketing techniques, and marketing just means making it known and how we make known these issues to raise what? Consciousness. That's what we started off at the, at the top of the program talking about, increasing critical thinking and reclaiming consciousness. The way that we do that is by utilizing these tools. But we could have all those tools, but if we don't have the right consciousness, we'll just use it for the wrong purposes. Dr. Kuo, I want to thank you for being with us. Before you leave us this evening, give out that information one more time for our listening audience, the, the websites and, and your website, how they can reach you, all the information you want to get. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you, can, uh, you can get my books, DVDs, Black History posters, and so forth uh, at uh, whatdoesitmeantobeblack.com. Again, what does it mean to be black dot com? All right. For those of you who are even at though it's kinda short notice, if you're able to make it to the Black Homeschool Expo, 
I want, or even if you're not able to make it, I want you to go to liberatedmindsexpo.com, liberatedmindsexpo.com. That will give you all the information that you need, liberatedmindsexpo.com, right? For those of you who are interested in helping to raise capital and consciousness, that means the raising money and the right mentality, uh, this is for everybody listening. You should go to buyblackmovement.com, buyblackmovement.com, and become a supporter today for as little as $30 and get quality black-made products shipped to your door automatically every month. You can get the same thing shipped to yourself every month, or you can change your order every month, whichever you prefer. I just have a standing order where I get, you know, a Nubian Heritage soap and uh, and some other things sent to me every month, uh, Motherland's Gold Moringa and other nutritionals and things. Um, so, yes, brother, thank you so much once again for having me on. Uh, I'm at your service. Whenever you need uh, some insights onto some, uh, on, or commentary on some current events or ancient happenings, please keep me in mind. And hopefully I will be getting back to the Philadelphia area soon. Uh, where we can do a program as we did before. Brother Cool, before you go, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, you had uh, hundreds of vendors basically uh, around the diaspora. So you do have uh, vendors on the continent that'll, that ship products. One of the uh, products from the continent that we have is the Motherland's Gold Moringa. Okay. Uh, Moringa is the most nutritionally dense plant on planet Earth. Now, this is scientific research talking. You can Google it yourself, and you'll even find out that the World Health Organization um, has said some pretty powerful things about it. Motherland's Gold Moringa uh, is the company that produces it for the Buy Black movement, and it is the top-selling product in the movement. Uh, what we've discovered is that when we have health issues, whether it's uh, diabetes, you know, high blood pressure and uh, obesity, many of the challenges that we face in terms of health um, do not require medicine per se. It requires proper nutrition. Our bodies are craving certain nutrients that we're not giving it because we're eating the standard American diet, which is nutrient deficient. But when your body starts getting all of those nutrients that are in the moringa, uh, your body starts healing and repairing itself. Okay, so this is something where you know, and all this is on the website. If you again, if you go to buyblackmovement.com, type in moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A, or if you want to Google moringa by itself, you'll find out that what I'm saying is true. Uh, so this is just one of hundreds of different products. Um, we got a brother out of North Carolina with the Shepherd's Harvest Nutritional Company who has all sorts of incredible products. So there's a whole world of solutions out there for us that we've created. We just have to make it better known to our people, and that's what this is all about. Dr. Cool, I want to thank you for being with us, and I'll be in touch with you soon. All right. Sounds good, brother. Thank